Welcome to Twin Peaks Radio, the show where we remember, in the words of Major Garland Briggs, a real mystery can't be solved, not completely. It's always just out of reach, like a light around the corner. You might catch a glimpse of what it reveals, feel its warmth, but you can't know the heart of it. Not really. That's what gives it value. It can't be cracked. It's bigger than you and me. Bigger than everything we know. Or like everyone else doing a podcast or video series on Twin Peaks. Let's pretend we can solve all of it if we just keep beating our heads against it. I am drinking Death Wish today. I'm Professor Robert E.G. Black, and today I'm not even going to get to the pilot episode. Because I said in my pilot episode that I'd be talking about the TV Guide in the week the show premiered. I found it interesting, first of all, that apparently the only nighttime soap still on the air was Dallas. I thought there were still a couple more in 1990. Apparently not. It's a bunch of cop shows, detective shows, things like that. Which Twin Peaks was also that, so I guess it was the a sort of transition from 80s to 90s TV in that way. I found it interesting before I even get to the article on Twin Peaks itself. Shows that premiered this, was it the same week? No, this was the spring preview, so it was lots of new TV shows over the spring. A Family for Joe, never heard of it. Help, H-E-L-P, that's an acronym. Don't remember it. In Living Color, great sketch show on Fox. Carol and Company, that sounds vaguely familiar. Oh, Carol Burnett, okay, yeah. The TV version of The Outsiders, I remember watching that, yeah, on Sundays. Capital News, don't recall it. His and Hers. Maybe. Normal Life. Nah, no memory of that. Sydney. I do remember that one. Valerie Bertinelli. Private Eye. FM. Is this a ripoff of Midnight Caller? Hmm. Eh, it doesn't. The description doesn't suggest it's a investigation kind of show. The Marshall Chronicles. No idea. Feels like a ripoff of Parker Lewis Can't Lose and Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Equal Justice, yeah, I remember that one. Wings, remember watching Wings at the beginning. Baghdad Cafe, vaguely remember that. Sugar and Spice, Bruce Place, Down at Home. The Seinfeld Chronicles, that's Seinfeld before they changed the title. Shannon's Deal. Working Girl, so sitcom version of the movie. A few film adaptations in there. So then, got an article on Melissa Gilbert, and then the article... Welcome to the weird new world of Twin Peaks, where nothing is quite what it seems and a killer is on the loose. Across the top, it's got some brief profiles of main characters. FBI agent Dale Cooper, called in to solve the murder of Laura Palmer, has a new age prescience and a humorously methodical temperament. Yeah, that works. Sheriff Harry S. Truman grew up in Twin Peaks and knows more about the people in the town than they do about themselves. Not entirely true. He's also blind, too. Oh, look, who's the third one? Jocelyn Packard is an Asian woman who inherited the Packard sawmill when her husband died. She's an outsider, but has an ally in the sheriff. Yeah. Yeah. There'll be some interesting stuff about Josie later. I feel like she was always supposed to be even more important than she was. That's why we see her first. Catherine Martell is locked in a tremendous power struggle with her sister-in-law, Jocelyn Packard to gain control of the Packard sawmill. So they're setting up the nighttime soap opera stuff, which is cool. Laura Palmer is the high school homecoming queen found brutally murdered in the opening episode. Flashbacks reveal an unsuspected seamy side of her life. James Hurley is a high school senior, a sensitive loner on a Harley, takes risks to find out the truth about the people he loves. I'm not sure if there'll be a specific time to talk about this, but I, I, I have a... I wonder about James as a character, because if you look at him as a comparison to Bobby, Laura's involved with both. Bobby is an obvious character, the jock who's also a drug dealer. Fine. Simple. They kind of go together in a way, because he has power over people. He's popular, people like him, people need things from him. But what is James? What he should be, I think, is something closer to Wally in Season 3. He should be in something more like Marlon Brando. He's the biker, and he's sensitive. He is that. He's both. He's a biker, and he's sensitive. But he shouldn't be dumb. Bobby should be the dumb one. I, know, I'm, I love that Bobby isn't. I love that Bobby ends up being who he is along the way. 
and who he becomes in season three. But the way the character should be is that there's the popular jock who also gives her the drugs. You know, he's important to her life. And then there's the sensitive, well-read rebel. I feel like he should be a little more rebel without a cause. Except, was he well-read? He was well-spoken. Been a little while since I watched that movie. We learn in The Secret History of Twin Peaks that his favorite book is Charlotte's Web. And that's fine. It's a great book. But I feel like... I feel like I, I, w- I want James to be a well-read... So many people hate James, so this is going to come across weird. But I like James. I like who he is. I just want him to be more. I feel like his favorite book should be something like Portrait of an Artist as a Young Man or Ulysses. He should be like this slightly pretentious guy. Like you see him as this biker and then that sensitive side is actually more overwhelming and he's smarter than people and he understands stuff. And that would drive that investigation along with Donna as we go even more because he wants to understand And maybe we wouldn't get the weird James plot in season two, because we wouldn't need it. We wouldn't need to rehash the relationship drama of James. I don't know. I just think he's better than what we got, or should have been. It makes for a better counter to who Bobby is. Michael Antkin describes the series as a kabuki-style Peyton place. I don't know if I ever watched Peyton Place, but I always had a vague sense of it as a kid. I don't even remember when it was on. Maybe it wasn't on while I was alive, and that's why I knew it. But I did watch the soap operas of the 80s, off and on. I think the only couple we watched regularly were Hotel, and I think for a little while we watched Dynasty regularly. But on my little tiny TV that I bought for 20 bucks at a yard sale, little tiny black and white TV that I had in my room, I would stay up past my bedtime and watch, like, L.A. Law. Johnny Carson. He's saying, it's Mark Frost saying this. We're just trying to reimagine the genre of the nighttime soap, the way Hill Street Blues did the cop show a decade ago. Dynasty had a campy quality, outrageously larger than life and glitzy and glamorous. David brings a certain surreal quality. Yeah, that fits. More character profiles. Bobby Briggs is a military brat with a bad temper. In love with Laura Palmer, he is also involved with the wife of a local truck driver. Spoilers. Benjamin Horn is a local mogul and real estate developer. He owns the Great Northern Hotel and also has eyes on the Packard Sawmill. Yeah. Audrey Horn, a classmate of Laura Palmer, has a precocious sexuality and is used to getting her own way. She loathes her dad, Benjamin Horn. I was watching... What was I watching last night? I don't remember if this was Mackenzie Bradford or the vlog lady who said something about Audrey being the opposite of Laura, but I liked it. Is that Laura is this, everyone thinks she's good, and that's who she plays at school. She's the good girl. She's actually bad. Whereas Audrey plays the bad girl at school, you know, specifically smokes there, changes her shoes to the heels there, but she's really naive and innocent. Ed Hurley runs the local gas station. He is deeply divided about his feelings for his wife Nadine and Norma Jennings, whom he loves. Norma Jennings owns the Double R Diner. Her husband Hank is in jail, but may soon be out on parole, and the man she loves, Ed Hurley, is married. Dr. Lawrence Jacoby is a flaky psychiatrist. He treated Laura Palmer without her parents' knowledge, and now he knows too much for his own good. Pretty basic. There's much more to the article. I'm not going to read. just read the whole article. That'd be silly. Sunday night. Where are you? Where are you, Sunday? The new drama series from Mark Frost, Hill Street Blues, and director David Lynch is a stylish cross between Peyton Place and Lynch's Blue Velvet. It has evil lookalikes. No, it doesn't. I mean, eventually, yes, but it's a weird description up front. One-eyed harridans. What's a harridan? Strict, bothy, or belligerent old woman. Okay, yeah. Got one of those, at least. And a murdered homecoming queen, which brings FBI agent Dale Cooper, played by Lynch favorite Kyle McLaughlin, onto the scene. Among the many familiar faces populating this six-week series, Piper Laurie, Michael Ontke, and Joan Chen. To our premiere up against Crossing to Freedom and Jesus of Nazareth. 
And then it also, of course, was on that Thursday night. Opposite Cheers and Max Monroe Loose Cannon. Shadow Stevens. Wow, that's a name I haven't seen in a long time. Cooper and Truman uncover more about Laura Palmer's secret life and release James from jail along with spiteful Mike and Bobby. Catherine makes her plan to take over Josie's lumber mill known to Benjamin. Yeah, that's, that's descriptive. I'll get to talking about the actual episode next time. I gotta watch it again. In terms of scheduling, my wife and I just started watching season three last night. She hasn't seen it before. I had a couple comments. Three. One's a piece of information, and two is a question, because I have questions for later. One, I find it interesting. Laura died on a Thursday night, Friday morning. French word for Thursday, Judy. I'm mispronouncing it slightly, but it's Judy. Pretty sure it was um, Mackenzie Bradford that made this observation, but I liked it. I'm wondering if it's on purpose and if it fits. Dale talks to his tape recorder, Diane, who doesn't exist yet. So he's always talking into something that doesn't respond. Meanwhile, I mean, no, I have... Margaret Landerman is getting responses from something that she doesn't talk to. At least not that we see. We don't see her talk to it, I don't think. It just has things to say. So the log and tape recorder are sort of opposites. I'm wondering how that's going to play out. It's not really a question. It's just something to look for as I go. Now, I do have a question, though. For season three. Way ahead, way ahead. We see Nadine get really strong. I think we even see that she's strong before the amnesia. Not as strong, but strong. Why does One Punch Freddy exist when Nadine's already in the story? Why couldn't you tie Nadine back into the main storyline? She gets her shovel. She gets shit done. She goes and punches Mr. C. Whatever. We'll get there. Just remember... In the words of Major Garland Briggs, mystery is the most essential ingredient of life. Mystery creates wonder, which leads to curiosity, which in turn provides the grounds for our desire to understand who and what we truly are. Follow the show on Twitter at Peaks Radio and on Facebook at Twin Peaks Radio. This has been a production of Lemming Drop Studio. You can find links to more at lemmingdrops.com or join the Facebook group Lemming Drop Studio Tour. You can support all my shows at patreon.com slash lemmingdrops. Also, the owls may not be what they seem, but they still serve an imperative function. They remind us to look into the darkness. 